Okay. <clears throat> good afternoon, maybe good morning for you, student uh, in Denmark. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, next invited talk, uh, which will be given by uh, my colleague, uh, <clears throat> who is now at uh, Argus uh, in, in Denmark. Uh, so, Srikant Srinivasan, uh, he will uh, tell us about polynomials and computations. Please, Srikant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Sudhir. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, hello to all of you, either online or in person. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, so I'm going to give this talk about uh, polynomials and computations. This is basically a talk at the interface of some uh, algebraic slash combinatorial questions and theoretical computer science. And uh, I'll tell you about some recent work uh, in this area with my uh, uh, collaborators, Nutan Limay and Sebastian Tavans. Okay. So here's the vague outline of the talk. So uh, I'm, I'm going to describe a very simple elementary combinatorial question about polynomials. Uh, this should be something that you can, you can explain to anybody with a basic uh, education in mathematics. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about the context behind this question and about its connections to a famous uh, question in theoretical computer science called the VP versus VNP question. And finally, I'll tell you the statement of a recent theorem that we proved, which makes some sort of progress towards uh, understanding this question. Okay. So that's the basic outline. So let me start off with some basic uh, notation that I'll be using throughout this talk. So throughout, I'm going to be talking about uh, infinite sequences of polynomials. Okay, so I have an infinite sequence of multivariate polynomials in an increasing number of variables. And throughout, I'll be referring to some sort of infinite sequence. So even from time to time, if I refer to a particular polynomial in n variables, it should be understood that I'm referring to an element of this infinite sequence. Okay. So one concrete example to keep in mind is, for instance, the sequence of determinant polynomials. So suppose I look at the n by n determinant, right? So fix a parameter little n, and I have a little n by little n matrix. And I think of the entries of that matrix as uh, indeterminates or variables. So the n by n determinant is a polynomial of degree n, little n, in these capital N square many indeterminates. I'm sorry, in these little n square uh, many indeterminates. Uh, so this is one kind of concrete uh, infinite sequence of polynomials as little n goes to infinity. So that's a kind of an example to keep in mind uh, if you want to keep things concrete. Okay. And uh, from time to time, I'll be referring to various parameters related to these polynomials. And all these parameters will be expressed as functions of the number of variables, which will always be capital N. And in order to avoid uh, all sorts of technical complications, I'll just, uh, I'll be very, very loose when it comes to parameters. So I'll be, I'll make all sorts of approximations, et cetera, which I hope you'll forgive. Uh, but just a couple of small shorthand uh, notations that I'll use uh, from time to time. When I say a small function of capital N, a small number, it's a function which is sort of polynomially growing with capital N. So something like N square or N cubed or N to some constant. And this constant here is an independent of N. Whereas a large function is something which is not small. So something which is growing faster than any polynomial, something like N to the log N, N to the root N, et cetera. Okay, so these are all functions and I'll make all sorts of approximations when it comes to dealing with functions of n, just to keep uh, things somewhat simple. Okay, so with that said, let me start off with the, the basic problem, which as again, as I said, is a very simple combinatorial problem that you can describe to anybody. So here's the problem. Okay, so suppose I have uh, a multivariate polynomial, okay, in n capital N variables over some field. And I think of this, uh, the degree of this polynomial as uh, a number d, which is typically a function of n, but here I'll bound by n. Okay, and uh, the question we're interested in understanding is what is the smallest algebraic expression for this polynomial? Okay, so when I write down this polynomial, if I write it down on a piece of paper, what is the smallest algebraic expression for this polynomial? Okay, so for instance, I can always write down a polynomial as a sum of its monomials, right? I, that's how a polynomial is defined. I can always write down as a linear combination of monomials. And such an expression is the kind of expression we're looking at. This is an example of this kind of expression. And so this kind of expression is what we call a sigma pi formula for the polynomial. Okay, so it's a very simple kind of expression for this polynomial. It's a sigma pi formula. Why sigma pi? It's the name is ho hopefully fairly clear. It's a sum of product 
of variables and field constants and therefore sigma pi. Okay, and when we are given an expression of this form, what we are uh, interested in understanding is what is the size of this expression. Okay, so for instance, if I look at the three by three determinant, of course, I can write it down as a sum of monomials this way. And now what is the size of this expression? Well, the size of this expression is essentially the number of symbols involved in writing this down. Okay, so however many symbols are required in this expression on the right hand side, that's the size of the expression. And what we are interested in is in minimizing the size of such an expression. Okay. Now, when it comes to sigma pi formulas, this is a fairly easy thing to understand. So if I given a sigma pi formula for a polynomial P, the size is roughly, and here I'm approximating here already, the size is roughly the number of monomials with non-zero coefficient in this polynomial, right? That's roughly the size of this expression. And for a polynomial of degree D, the, the size of this expression can therefore be the number of monomials of degree D. Okay. And uh, again, approximating a little bit, this is something like n to the D. Okay, it's a number of variables to the degree of the polynomial. Okay, that's the size of uh, a sigma pi formula for P. Okay, and expressions of this size I think of as essentially trivial because I can always write down a polynomial of degree D as a sum of monomials and get an expression of this size. And now the question we are interested in is can we find large, I mean, more complicated but smaller, more succinct expressions for this polynomial? Okay, can we get more succinct expressions if you allow for more complicated expressions, for instance, involving parentheses and all sorts of algebraic operations? Okay, that's the basic uh, uh, question. So, if you think about this question from kind of a bottom up point of view, the first uh, more complicated class of expressions you might, be look, you might look at are what are called sigma pi sigma formulas. Okay, so let me just quickly define that. So, what's a sigma pi sigma formula? Sigma pi formula was a sum of product of things. So a sigma pi sigma formula is going to be a sum of product of sum of things. Or another way of saying it is that instead of just allowing variables and field constants inside the products, we allow for general polynomials of degree at most one. So we allow for linear polynomials here. Okay. So a sigma pi sigma formula is a sum of product of linear polynomials. Okay, that's what it is. And already looking at such expressions leads to fairly non-trivial and interesting questions. And that's what I'll talk about for a large portion of this talk. Okay, so a sigma pi sigma formula is just this. And another kind of way of describing the same thing that computer scientists really like is via this pictorial representation. Okay, so this picture, this picture represents exactly the same thing as this algebraic expression on top here. The sum on top sort of represents the outermost sum. The product re represents, the products represent the various uh, summands, the various products in the summands. And the sums below them refer, refer to the re linear functions and so on. Okay, so this is exactly the same as this algebraic expression on top. And again, the size of such an expression is just the number of symbols you need to use to write this down on a piece of paper. So if you write down the whole expression, how many symbols do you use? Or in terms of this picture, you can look at the size of this picture. So if you think of this as a graph, you can look at the number of edges in this graph, for instance, and that will be a good indicator of the size of this expression. Okay, so again, to come back to our question, we're given a polynomial P, and the question is, can we always find smaller sigma pi sigma formulas? Okay, then sigma pi formulas. So if you recall, sigma pi formulas essentially have trivial size. Can we find always smaller sigma pi sigma formulas for the polynomials that we have? Okay, and uh, the answer to this question is fairly easy, actually. It turns out that the answer is no. Okay, so if you look at a generic or a random polynomial, so I don't want to uh, define exactly what this means, but essentially for most polynomials defined in a suitable way, there is no sigma pi sigma formula of size much better than trivial. Okay, so for... Uh, for most polynomials in some well-defined sense, you cannot really find smaller sigma pi sigma expressions than sigma pi expressions, okay? So there's not really much uh, gained by looking at these more complicated kinds of expressions. And the question that we want to ask here is what about certain explicit polynomials, okay? So I know that most polynomials P have this feature that they do not have smaller sigma pi sigma expressions than sigma pi expressions. Can we actually write down explicit polynomials constructively? Can we write down polynomials that have this property, that have this kind of incompressibility property when we look at sigma pi sigma expressions? And this is a kind of problem that's very, very uh, common and specific to theoretical computer science is that you have, you know, the existence of an object by some sort of non constructive argument, but you want to make the argument constructive and give an explicit example of such an object. Okay, this is sometimes called the problem of finding hay in a haystack. Yeah, so we all know finding needles in haystacks are hard, right, because needles are by definition hard to find, but hay in a haystack. So most polynomials in this case have this given property. And now can you write down explicitly a single polynomial or a sequence, an infinite sequence of polynomials with this kind of property? 
That's the basic question. Okay. So in this uh, particular setting, this would be called the question of proving explicit lower bounds. Because what you want to do is you want to find out and find an explicit sequence of polynomials that do not have small sigma pi sigma expressions. So lower bound refers to a lower bound on this size. Okay. So this is all, uh, this is the basic question, but this is still fairly abstract. So let me make it a little bit more concrete with the example of the determinant polynomial. So again, the determinant polynomial is this polynomial on n, little n squared many indeterminates. And if I write down a sigma pi expression for it, the standard expression is this uh, Leibniz expansion, which looks like this. So the size of this expression is essentially the number of monomials in the determinant, which is roughly n to the n, okay? So now what if, what if I look at sigma pi sigma expressions now? So I allow for some of the products, not just of variables and field constants, but linear polynomials. Can we find smaller expressions? And the answer is actually a fairly non-trivial answer. It turns out that there are smaller expressions for the determinant polynomial, sigma pi sigma expressions. They are of size something like n to the square root n, which is much better than n to the n, okay? And now the, the kind of question, the flavor of the question that we are trying to ask is, is this the best possible, okay? Can you show that the determinant does not have smaller sigma pi sigma formulas than this uh, thing that's known? Okay, the answer to this is suspected to be yes, but it's it's quite stubborn and we don't know how to prove this yet. Okay, so if you look at the sigma pi case, the answer was fairly easy to deduce because the size of the smallest expression is just the number of monomials. So that's very easy to analyze. But when you look at sigma pi sigma expressions, that doesn't seem to be an easy way of understanding how to show that a polynomial does not have small expressions of this kind. Okay, and that's the kind of technical challenge that is kind of interesting when it comes to dealing with this problem. So I hope uh, the statement of the problem was reasonably clear. If not, I'm happy to take a question or two. If there is one. Okay. All right. So I'll assume that uh, things are reasonably clear. So, so now let me tell you a little bit. So this is a fairly simple combinatorial question about polynomials. Show that certain polynomials do not have small sigma pi sigma formulas. And now what does this have to do with the other kinds of questions? So where does this come from? So the general context behind this question is the so-called VP versus VNP question from theoretical computer science, okay? And uh, so I, I, you may have heard of the famous P versus NP question. So it's one of the seven millennium uh, problems from the Clay Mathematics Institute. Uh, and it's one of those uh, problems for which you can win a million dollars if you solve it. Uh, so this is kind of an algebraic analog uh, of this P versus NP question. Okay, so the P versus NP question deals with uh, certain combinatorial optimization problems and asks if they are efficient algorithms or not. Whereas the VP versus VNP question looks at algebraic versions of these kinds of problems and asks if they're efficient algebraic algorithms for these problems or not. Okay, so let me just briefly define this question and tell you the question, uh, relationship to the question that we already saw. Okay, so throughout we're gonna be dealing not with uh, general kinds of computation problems, but computation problems are defined by infinite sequences of polynomials. Okay, so for example, we have seen the sequence of determinant polynomials, but in general, you have an infinite sequence of polynomials. And what's the computational problem associated to the sequence of polynomials? Well, it's just the problem of evaluating these polynomials. Okay, it's not a problem about solving any equations or anything like that. It's just the problem of evaluating these polynomials. So the input to the uh, algorithm is a point A in F to the N. And the question is, can you evaluate the nth polynomial of the sequence at the point A? Okay, so for instance, you can look at the determinant uh, sequence of polynomials and this is just the problem in that case of evaluating the computing the determinant of an n by n matrix okay and so similar to determinant this kind of general framework captures many natural computational questions so determinant is one example there are other examples related to co computing the products of matrices and many other uh, very natural examples that are captured in this general framework okay so we only deal with polynomials, I mean, computational problems of this form, the problem of evaluating an infinite sequence of polynomials. And when we're dealing with computational problems of this form, we look at algorithms that also have a similarly algebraic structure, okay? So let me tell you a little bit about this VP, uh, which is a class of computational problems, okay? So suppose you're given a computational problem of this algebraic form, right? You have a sequence of polynomials, you want to evaluate one of these polynomials at a given point. Right. So now what can a general algorithm do to do this kind of evaluation? Well, a general algorithm can do whatever it likes. It can apply uh, algebraic operations. It can apply exponential operations. It can apply transcendental operations, non-algebraic things of various kinds. Right. But it's very natural to look at uh, algorithms that only use algebraic operations in order to solve algebraic problems. 
Okay, so specifically, since polynomials are defined using additions and multiplications, it's very natural to look at algorithms themselves that use only additions and multiplications in order to do this evaluation. Okay, and when you restrict algorithms to doing only this, what you end up with are what are called algebraic circuits. And that's what I want to define for you. So what's an algebraic circuit? Roughly speaking, it's an algorithm that uses additions and multiplications in order to evaluate polynomials. Okay, so this is the, the high level definition and here's a pictorial definition. So algebraic circuits are essentially motivated by the circuits in our computers, but whereas the circuits in our computers uh, implement all sorts of logical operations, these circuits implement only additions and multiplications. Okay, so you have a polynomial P and you want to evaluate this polynomial P at some point. So you think you array the variables of the polynomial at the bottom here, and these will be elements of the field eventually. And what you're allowed to do is iteratively apply simple operations. So simple operations in this case are linear combinations and multiplications. And you iteratively apply these to the variables and things that you compute. And as this computation continues, as you iteratively apply these operations more and more, you complete, compute more and more complicated polynomials in your underlying variables until eventually you reach a point where you actually computed the polynomial you're interested in. Okay, and this essentially is an algebraic circuit and it gives you a recipe for evaluating this polynomial because you just sort of follow uh, the way this computation continues and you get an efficient algorithm. Okay, so that's essentially an algebraic circuit. Uh, the efficiency of this algorithm is the number of operations, which is essentially the number of edges in this graph. Okay, so you take this graph, the number of edges is essentially a number of operations you perform and that gives you the size of this algebraic circuit or the efficiency of this algorithm. Okay. So from this pictorial definition, it should be fairly clear that these circuits generalize the kinds of expressions we saw some time ago, right? The expression that we saw some time ago, it, we had this pictorial way of looking at it, sigma pi sigma formulas, and they were essentially circuits of a very specific kind. Specifically, the graph theoretic structure of that circuit was a, that of a tree. So it was like a rooted directed tree, whereas this is a more general kind of graph. So circuits are kind of much more general versions of formulas. So a formula is in particular a circuit, but not vice versa. Okay, so this, the notion of an algebraic circuit leads a restricted, but still very natural and rich class of algorithms for solving algebraic problems. And in general, every algebraic problem that I know about has the best algorithm that we know for it comes from an algebraic circuit. So as far as uh, most people are concerned, these are the only algorithms we have for solving uh, algebraic problems. Okay, all right. So that's an algebraic circuit. Now the class VP in this VP versus VNP question, is essentially it contains all those computational problems. So a computational problem is just a sequence of polynomials. It contains all those computational problems that have efficient algebraic circuits, that have small algebraic circuits. So that have algebraic circuits that are of size polynomial in the number of variables. Okay, so uh, again, an excellent example of this is the determinant uh, polynomial. So this sequence of polynomials by Gaussian elimination or other, uh, or other means can be shown to have small algebraic circuits. So that's an example of a sequence of polynomials in VP. Okay, so that's VP. So now let me define the VP versus VNP question and tell you the relationship to the problem that I already told you about. Okay, so what's the VP versus VNP question? Well, the question that we first asking, that we first ask ourselves is, okay, the determinant polynomial, for instance, is a sequence of polynomials that has small algebraic circuits. So now are there polynomial families that have no small algebraic circuits? Yeah, just like we asked, are there sequence of polynomials that have no small sigma pi sigma formulas? Similarly, let's ask, are there polynomial families that have no small algebraic circuits? And the answer to this question again is yes. And in fact, a generic family of polynomials, a random family of polynomials has this property that it has no small algebraic circuits. Okay, so you cannot do a much better than trivial as a matter of fact. Okay, and now again, the question is, you have a lot of hay, can you find hay in this haystack? Can you find explicit examples of polynomials that do not have small algebraic circuits? And this is essentially the VP versus VNP question. Okay, so can you find explicit examples of computational problems of this algebraic form that do not have efficient algebraic circuits or algorithms of this algebraic form. Okay, and that's the VP versus VNP question. So it's kind of a special case of the P versus NP question and a well, very well-known question in theoretical computer science. But unlike the P versus NP question, where the challenge is that we don't really have a technique to address it at all, there are techniques to address the VP versus VNP question. Okay, so this is what makes it a very tantalizing kind of goal. It seems like something that could be realizable because there are very nice approaches towards attacking this question and maybe then using that as a stepping stone towards the previous NP question. And this very concrete approach, one such very concrete approach is by understanding just these sigma pi sigma formulas that I told you about some time ago. Okay, so let me just tell you this connection and then I'll tell you the statement of a theorem. Okay, so 
I said uh, on the previous slide that there is a way of coming up with the polynomials, coming, uh, resolving the VP versus variant equation, which is to come up with a sequence of polynomials that do not have small algebraic circuits. There's a way of establishing this via understanding simply sigma pi sigma formulas. Okay, so wh what is this way? And so here's a statement of a theorem that is not due to us. It's actually the sequence of a long line of work starting from some work in the 80s. So what the sequence of work te says, tells, us, tells us is the following. So suppose I have a sequence of polynomials in VP. Okay, recall that we want to show that some sequence of polynomials does not have small algebraic circuits. So we want to show that something is not in VP. That's the ultimate goal. But this theorem gives us a way of doing that. Okay, so what does this theorem say? So it says, start with a sequence of polynomials in VP. Okay, I assume that these polynomials have degree D. Okay, and what this says is that you can, then the same, the nth polynomial in the sequence Pn has a sigma pi sigma formula of size, something like n to the square root d. Okay, n to the square root d. So now I don't want you to get lost in the parameters here, but the main thing I want you to observe from this theorem is what it's saying is that from the assumption that the sequence of polynomials in VP, you're getting a sigma pi sigma formula of non-trivial size, right? So this n to the square root d is much better than trivial. Okay, so just recall trivial was just a number of monomials, which is like n to the d. This is saying that if you know that the polynomial is in VP, then in fact, you have a sigma pi sigma formula of non-trivial size, size much better than trivial, n to the root. Okay, and this gives us a way towards attacking the VP versus VNP question. If you want to show that an explicit sequence of polynomials is not in VP, then what we could do is instead show that it does not have sigma pi sigma formulas of, si of non-trivial size, or even of size into the root D, maybe size roughly into the root D. If you could show that it does not have size, so could sub sigma pi sigma formulas of size slightly more than into the root D, then we would show in particular that the polynomial sequence is not in VP. Okay. So, so what, if, what this uh, long line of work essentially tells us is that this very general question, this question of uh, uh, understanding lower, proving lower bounds for a very general class of algorithms reduces to understanding this very concrete question about sigma pi sigma formulas. Okay, and this is what is really nice about this question. Okay, unfortunately though, the best lower bound, so, so now we just need to understand sigma pi sigma formulas and prove lower bounds for them, and then we could understand the VP versus VNP question. Unfortunately though, the best lower bound known until very recently was a lower bound of just n cubed. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to beat this n to the root d, but irrespective of what d is, as long as it's bounded by n, the best lower bound known until recently was something like n to into the three independent of T. Okay, and this is a work of Kayal, Saha and Tavanas from about five years ago. And this finally brings me uh, to the result that we recently proved. Okay, and there are a few caveats, technical caveats to this result, which you can ignore. Uh, but what we show is that there's an explicit sequence of polynomials, okay, that have no sigma pi sigma formulas of size less than n to the root. So recall that from the previous slide, this is precisely the bound we need to beat in order to resolve the VP versus VNP question. But unfortunately, we didn't even know how to get to into the root D until now. And what we showed is that now for an explicit sequence of polynomials, you can show a lower bound of something like into the square root D. Okay. And I can tell you uh, explicitly what this sequence of polynomials is. So it's a very simple sequence of polynomials. It's, it's just called the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial. Okay, and what is it? The name is fairly self-explanatory. So suppose I have, a, a, I have a sequence of D n by n matrices, right? And I think of the entries of these matrices as variables or indeterminates. Now, if I take the product of all these matrices together, that's going to be an n by n matrix, but the entries of that matrix are going to be polynomials in the indeterminates here. Okay, so if I take the product of these D n by n matrices, the entries of that matrix are going to be polynomials in these, uh, uh, in the entries of these individual matrices. And let's say the one one -th entry of that matrix, I can take any entry that I want, but for example, I can take the one one -th entry, that's gonna be some polynomial, and that's the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial with these parameters, okay? So you can easily check that the number of variables, something like D times N squared, and this is a polynomial of degree D in so many variables, okay? And it's for this polynomial that we are able to show that there are no sigma pi sigma formulas of small size. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. So this uh, D, is it a constant or is, the, is it a function of N? Does it vary with N? Right. So we would like it to vary with N. Uh, we would, in fact, like it to be uh, as large as possible because the more the D is, the better bound, the better the bound that we get. 
Uh, and for, unfortunately for us, we, we do allow it to vary with n, but it has to be bounded by something like log n. And in your previous formulation also, d was a function of n in general, but uh, yes. you said d less equal n or something like that. Right. So we always put a restriction of d of something like n. Yeah. And uh, this is for various technical reasons, right? But we would like it to be as close to n as possible. So because that will make our bound stronger. Uh, but for the for the purposes of understanding the BP versus BNP question, it doesn't really matter as long as D is allowed to vary as some function of n, as, as long as it's allowed to go with to infinity with n, then we still have the capability of proving a super polynomial lower. Right? So in our situation, we have uh, a bound of D, a bound of log n on D. And this is, uh, yeah, this is a slight disadvantage because we cannot prove very strong bounds. But for the purpose of BP versus BNP, it's as good as any other function of n. So yes, we do want it to go to infinity with n. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so great. Uh, so this is the statement of the result. So we have an explicit sequence of polynomials for which we are able to prove sigma pi sigma formula lower bounds. Notice that we get, we get right to the boundary of where we could resolve the VP versus VNP question, but we don't. Because what we need is a bound of more than n to the root t. Yeah, but what we get is exactly a bound of n to the root t. Okay, and the reason for this is very simple. The reason is that IMM, this polynomial here, does in fact have small algebraic circuits. Okay, so we cannot hope to prove that it does not have small algebraic circuits because it does. So what we need is, what is uh, interesting about this work is now we've come up with some sort of techniques for proving uh, lower bounds on the sigma pi sigma formulas, which was not clear how to do before. And now the question is, can we push these techniques further and get beyond n to the root d, which would resolve the weak of the equation. Okay. I think that's about all I had to say. So let me just conclude with a corollary for the determinant uh, polynomials, which uh, kind of was a running example. So as a corollary to this uh, lower bound for IMM, we are also able to show that the n by n determinant does not have sigma pi sigma formulas of size something like n to the root log n. Okay. So n to the root log n is a super polynomial function of n, so which is good. So it's large. It's a large number. But unfortunately, this is still not the right answer as far as we know. As far as we know, the right answer should be something like n to the root n, but we don't know how to prove that yet. But this is the best that uh, we know so far. Okay, so that's about all I had to say. So if there is kind of a couple of takeaway messages from my talk. I hope you understood the VP versus BNP question and how it reduces to this very concrete question of proving lower bounds for sigma pi sigma formulas. We didn't know how, we didn't have any techniques for how to do this before, but now we do have some techniques for proving lower bounds of this form. Okay. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Srikant, for this uh, uh, very clear exposition. Uh, I think it's open for questions for anybody here in the audience or uh, online. Those who are online can just type in the chat box uh, and uh, you know, we'll try to convey these questions to the speaker. Uh, can I ask a very naive question? I mean, maybe uh, uh, perhaps I'm confused. So, your last theorem, what does it say? Whether uh, does it say VP is not equal to VNP or? Uh, yeah. So let me, yeah, so, uh, so the, the theorem from before that I told you about says that if you have a polynomial sequence in VP, then you can find sigma pi sigma formulas of size n to the some constant times square root d. Right. And so now in order to show that something is not in VP, you have to show that it does not have sigma pi sigma formulas of size n to any constant times square root d. Right. So what we are able to do is get n to the square root d. So in order to prove VP is not equal to BNP, we would have to uh, change the exponent to something that's asymptotically greater than square root D. So for instance, N to the D to the 0.75 would be more than sufficient, but we don't have that yet. So we need, yeah, so we are right at the boundary, so to speak. So it square root D times, yeah. Slightly like stronger version of this theorem. Would be sufficient. Okay. That's right. Just one more thing, can you, uh, you know, uh, unravel the uh, abbreviations that you use for uh, other people, GKKS and so on. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Right. So, so thank, yeah, thanks for asking this question. So this, um, 
So this sequencer works on what is called depth reduction. Uh, so I haven't described to you why it's called depth reduction, but there's a very good reason. So this uh, actually started with uh, work of Valiant, uh, Skum, Berkowitz, and Rakoff. So Valiant is the V behind the VP versus VNP. So it's sort of the uh, person who first formulated uh, some of these questions. And this final theorem that I've uh, written down here, this is due to uh, work of four Indian researchers from uh, 2013. So this is uh, Gupta, Kayal, Kamat, and Saptarishi. So the Kayal here is Neeraj Kayal, who won the Infosys Prize quite recently uh, for, uh, I think, his uh, contributions to this field of algebraic complexity. Yeah. And this uh, th thing at the bottom is Kayal, Saha, and Tavanas. So it's Kayal again, and Tavanas is my co-author from this work. Thank you. So if there are no further questions, let's thank Srikant again for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can you unmute? Yes. Uh, hi, I, Srikant, are you still there? Hello? Uh, I'm sorry, I think Meena, uh, Meena Mahajan, you, you raised your hand and I, I did not notice. Please excuse me. Srikant is there, maybe he can. Uh... Yeah, I'm uh, okay. Uh, Meena, are you there? Uh, okay, there's something in the chat box for you. Ah, uh, Sudhir, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I, I, I couldn't unmute uh, for a short while. Yeah, no, I think people have to uh, permit us. In fact, even uh, I have to be, I have to request to, uh, you know, unmute uh, the thing and speak. Right, right. I'm not sure if uh, Mina Maiden is still there, but uh, it seems she raised her hand and I, I did not notice that. So that's it. Uh -huh. okay. uh -huh. I, I'm also new to this hybrid uh, conferences. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's all a little bit of a. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's. So it's, how are things? Things are going well. Yeah, things are going well. Yeah. Okay. You know, we are here physically in Trivendram. It's after two years. Uh -huh. I'm at actually I'm physically at a conference. So. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's great to see people uh, attending talks and so on. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. How are you yeah. doing? Yeah, yeah, doing well. Doing, uh, yeah, things are still open here, and we hope it continues that way. But, yeah, okay. numbers are rising, etc. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so I see that uh, Rajiv is already here. Uh, He's giving the public lecture in about uh, six minutes. Okay, great. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll maybe check with Mina if uh, yeah, what questions you had, and yeah. And just say that I'm, uh, uh, you know, that I'm sorry I, I missed that uh, hand of person. Yeah, I will. I will inform her. No. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sudhir. Yeah, and thanks very much for the invitation. 